Good morning. Welcome to all of you this morning. Great to be together for worship today. On this fifth Sunday after Pentecost, we'll hear Jesus do two miracles in the gospel, and they both have to do with touch. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, our sense of touch. Uh, when we get to the communion hymns today, the last communion hymn, if you want to jot this down, is not 803, it's 809. Let's stand up and we'll begin with our first hymn together. Childlike no cares could destroy Be there at our waking And give us, we pray Your bliss in our hearts, Lord In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Steadfast Lord, we confess to you our sinfulness. We have not loved you with our, all our heart, mind, and strength, and we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for our impatience with you and the people around us. Forgive us, Lord, for our fear, which clouds our hearts and minds, overshadowing your faithfulness to us. Forgive us, Lord, for our resistance to generously sharing the bountiful blessings that you entrust to us. Forgive us, Lord, for all of our sins, those of which we are aware and those of which we are unaware. Forgive us, Lord. It was for all of our sins that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for us, for forgiveness, and to give us new life. I announce his grace to all of you. 
in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The Lord is your keeper, the Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. To God on high be glory and peace to all the earth. Goodwill from God in heaven proclaimed at Jesus' birth. We praise and bless you, Father, your holy name we sing. Our thanks for your great glory, Lord God, our heavenly King. To you, O soul begotten, the Father's Son, we pray. O Lamb of God, our Savior, you take our sins away. Have mercy on us, Jesus, receive our heartfelt cry. Where you in power are seated at God's right hand on high. For you alone are holy, you only are the Lord. Forever and forever be worshipped and adored. You with the Holy Spirit alone are Lord most high. In God the Father's glory, Amen, our glad reply. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead by the healing medicine of the word and sacraments. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. 
they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust, there may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but, though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that, as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We often take our five senses for granted, but we all know just how important they are to us. If you lose your sense of sight, it's a real challenge to adapt to the world around you when you can't see anything. Or if you're deaf and can't hear, that changes the way you interact with the people in the world around you. If you can't smell or taste, now we know you might have COVID, that's some of the symptoms. But what about the sense of touch? That's one I think that we sometimes take for granted. Now I know that many of you knew Henry Hugh, longtime member of our congregation. He's gone ahead of us to be with the Lord. But because of some pinched nerves and some problems in his neck, he lost all the sensation in the tips of his fingers. And it made life very, very difficult for him. He had a hard time getting dressed in the morning because he just couldn't manipulate the buttons or the zippers very well. And when he came to Bible study on Thursday morning, he had a terrible time trying to turn a page because he couldn't feel where the pages began and ended. And then when he went to pay for his meal, it was a challenge to get the money out of his wallet because he just couldn't, couldn't quite grasp it. So that sense of touch is just as important as any of the other senses that God has created us with. And in the gospel this morning, touch is a very important part of two miracles that Jesus performs. Two very powerful miracles reminding us of who he is and what he can do for us. The first has to do with one of the rulers of the synagogue who comes to Jesus and says, my little girl is dying. Please come and lay your hands on her. Come and touch her so that she may be well and live. And the second miracle has to do with a woman who, Mark says, has had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And rather than helping her, after seeing all those doctors, it's only gotten worse and worse and worse. But she knows in her heart, if I can just touch Jesus, if I can just touch his clothing, I know I will be made well. So touch is very important in these two miracles. Now, we all know that there are many things in this world that you are not supposed to touch. You do not touch a hot burner on the stove. If you do, you learn your lesson very quickly. That is something not to touch. You do not want to touch poison ivy. Or you do not want to touch a fire ant mound in your yard. You do not want to touch a porcupine, a cactus, or those real spiky things on your palm tree out in your yard because you know how much that is going to hurt. But on the other hand, there are many things that we do want to touch. Anytime I see a dog, I want to touch that dog. I want to pet your dog as long as it's not going to bite me. If you have an itch, oh, I just, I got I to gotta touch that itch. I've got to scratch. Or food, some fried chicken, or a rack of ribs. You just want to get your hands on that. And of course, anything that says, do not touch. There is something in us that wants to touch whatever it is. You know, it's interesting in the Bible that there are many things that God's people were not supposed to touch. Now, when God's people had gotten out of Egypt and out of their slavery, and after God's people had made their way through the desert and through the Red Sea by the mighty hand of God, and they got to Mount Sinai, this was the mountain where God was going to be present. And the cloud of God's presence came down on the mountain. There's thunder, there's lightning, the ground shakes beneath their feet. And God tells Moses, tell the people, do not come near the mountain. Do not touch it. My people are not to come in contact with the holiness of God. Sinful people and God must keep their distance. A little bit later on in the history of Israel, King David decided... It's time to bring the Ark of the Covenant 
back to Jerusalem. Now, many years before that, Israel had actually lost some battles to the Philistines. They had lost the Ark of the Covenant. They lost that precious box that symbolized God's presence with them. So the Philistines kept it for a little bit, but it was more trouble than it was worth. And so they sent it back to Israel, and the Ark of the Covenant actually sits in somebody's barn for a while. Finally, David says, we're going to bring the Ark back. So they build a cart, and they hitch up two oxen. And the oxen are pulling the cart down the road, and they must have hit a rock or a uh, something in the, in the earth, a rut or something, and the cart shakes, and it looks like the ark is going to fall off the cart, and a man named Uzzah reaches out and, and steadies it for a moment. And then he's struck down and dies. Because God was very clear, you do not touch the holy things of God unless you are a priest or a Levite consecrated for that moment. You do not touch the holiness of God, Period. There were many things in the Bible God's people were not supposed to touch. But how different it is. How much everything changes when Jesus comes. When Jesus is born, the moment of incarnation, when the word becomes flesh, suddenly people can touch him. Jesus' mother can hold him in her arms. Simeon, waiting in the temple for Jesus, can hold the baby the Son of God, in his arms. People can embrace Jesus and welcome him. A woman can anoint his feet with perfume and dry it with her hair. People can grab Jesus and try to throw him off a cliff. And people can stretch out Jesus' arms and nail them to a cross to execute him by crucifixion. And by the same token, when the word becomes flesh, Jesus has hands and feet, and Jesus can touch. Jesus can touch people. He can grab Peter's hand when Peter is sinking in the water. Jesus can break bread with his hands and give it out to people and feed them. Jesus can touch the feet of his disciples and wash them. Jesus can bleed and suffer and die and then he can show himself to his disciples. After his resurrection, he says, touch me. Touch my wounds. See, it's me. I'm really alive, and I'm here with you. So the touch of Jesus changes everything. And sometimes we forget just how much we need that touch of Jesus. But in the gospel lesson today, these people knew they knew the power of his touch. They knew the power of a touch. First, we'll start with the woman. She pushes through the crowds just to get close to Jesus, and she just touches his clothing. Instantly, she stops bleeding. In a moment, she feels the strength and the healing in her body. What a moment that is. And then Jesus turns and says, Who touched me? She's afraid. But she explains to him what happened. And then Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith is well placed. You put your faith and your trust in the right person at the right time. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Then they go on to Jairus' house. But before they get there, they're told the young girl has already died. Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. Why all the weeping? Why all the mourning? She's not dead. She's just asleep. And so Jesus goes in with a couple of the disciples and with the parents. And he touches her. He takes her hand. And he says, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately, she's alive again. She gets up. She's walking around. Jesus was right. You can trust him. You can believe in him. You can put your faith in him. His touch brings life. We do forget how much we need his touch. Isaiah found out very quickly, one day Isaiah found himself in the very throne room of God. He finds himself in the very presence of God. There's fiery beings called seraphim flying back and forth. 
The, the whole room is, is shaking. The thunderous sounds of holy is our God are just overwhelming to him. And Isaiah says, I'm doomed. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live with people who are unclean. And then an angel takes an ember off of the altar and touches Isaiah's mouth and says, all your sin has been atoned for. And now, when the question is asked, who will go? Now Isaiah says, here I am, send me. He's been touched by the grace of God. He's, now he's ready to proclaim the gospel. Jeremiah had a similar experience. God comes to Jeremiah and says, you're going to be my spokesperson to Israel. Jeremiah says, I can't do that. I'm too young. I don't have enough experience. God says, I have touched your mouth. And you will go and you will tell people my word. The touch of God changes everything and made his people ready to do the work that God had for them to do. What a blessing it is that God still touches our lives, touches our mouths so that we can proclaim what he has done for us. In the sacrament, it is the body of our Lord. It is his blood. He touches us and proclaims that we're forgiven. All of our sins have been paid for. Proclaims that we will have life, even more life than death. Proclaims that we have the victory over the devil and the power of sin itself. God still powerfully touches our lives as a church. And that touch of God, that touch of God is vital to who we are as a church and to what we do as a church. You see, we know that we need to hear God's word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So we need, we need to hear what he has to say. We know that to be his witnesses, we need to see what God has done so that we can tell just like the shepherds. Let's go and see, and now let's go and tell. The Bible says that we are to taste and know that the Lord is good. And our prayers ascending to the Lord are a sweet-smelling aroma to him. He loves to hear our prayers. But we also need his touch. We can never take that for granted. We need to be together as his body, and receive his body and blood and be touched by our very Lord himself with that forgiveness, life, and salvation so that as a church, we can touch the lives of others. We can't just talk about it. We can't just think about it. We can't just hope that something will happen. As his body, we're the hands and feet of Jesus. And some people need to feel his love. Whether you're holding a hand to pray with somebody, or whether you're helping somebody into the doctor's office, or whether you're just embracing somebody that you haven't seen for a long, long time, and you are so happy to be worshiping with, or whether it's somebody that you're crying with, or somebody, we all know how powerful human touch is. We all know how much we missed touching other people for such a long time. We must have that. And what a gift from God that he still touches us. And as his church, we can still touch the lives of others because that is truly what brings us life. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, thank you for all of our senses. Thank you for our hearing and our sight and our smell and our taste. And especially today, the touch, being able to touch others and to be touched by you and by your love and by your grace and by your people. Help us to never forget what an amazing gift that is, Lord. Lord, show us who needs the touch of your love and send us, Lord, with that good news. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we bring all of our prayers and our petitions and our thanks and our praise to you today. We thank you, Lord, for your healing grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your word in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for making us your church. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we, we pray for our nation. We thank you for our freedoms. And we thank you 
for a chance to celebrate that next weekend, Independence Day. Heavenly Father, bless our leaders and those who rule over us, that they would do their jobs very well. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for our church, that we would continue to be bold in proclaiming the good news. Heavenly Father, we know that we're the ones who will bring light and hope and life as your dearly loved people. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for many who need your healing grace and and your power. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of the missing and the hurting and the grieving in Surfside, Florida. Bless the rescue workers as they continue to search. Heavenly Father, we pray for your healing grace for Beth and for Bob and for Jim, for Bill and Jean as they get ready for their cataract surgery this week. For Bob Fisher, thank you, Lord, that he has found a nursing home to go to. And we ask for your continued healing for Stephanie. Bless Ken this coming week, Lord, as he gets ready for his surgery. Bless his surgeon, and we pray for good procedure, good hip, and a quick and, and complete recovery, Lord. Lord, continue to bless uh, Jason Rayner as he heals in the hospital. And thank you for the, the doctors and nurses caring for him. Let your healing grace be with Charlene, May, James, and Bill. Michael and Paul, and Tony, and Susan, and Roger, with Dave and Nova, and Ed, and Mardell. Lord, we ask your uh, comfort for Mona and the family of Jim King as they mourn his death. We thank you, Lord, for the birth of a new son to Christina Everett, and pray your blessing on our other moms expecting their baby soon, Amanda and Kayla and Katie Norton. Continue to bless all those in our military, Lord, and keep them safe, especially Colin and Gregory, Nick and Christian, Kelly and Tyler and Cody. Lord, let your strength and guidance be with Denise and Kim. Bless Kip and Tammy and their mission work in Eastern Europe, and keep safe the Hans, the Rhodes, the Cranes, and uh, Janice Robinson during their travels, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Do you have any other prayers that you would like to include this morning? Lord, as we come to your altar, thank you for inviting us to come and experience your touch once again. The touch of your grace in the body and blood of Christ, filled with forgiveness, life, and salvation. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Thy bounties thus 
as stewards true receive. And gladly as thou blessest us, to thee our first fruits give. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross, and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Today. Uh, don't forget, the coastlines is in the back of your worship folder. There's lots of good information there. Uh, we'll have more information about the next round of Bible studies by next Sunday, and uh, I'll put something in my weekly email too. Uh, next week is also Might Box Sunday, so don't forget your Might Box. And uh, thank you for all the baby bottles you've returned. It's such a blessing for Alpha Women's Center. And if you meet somebody here today who's not a member of SOTC, please have them fill out a connect card for me. Just get me a phone number or email, something like that, so we can stay in touch. Thanks and God bless. Thank you.